want to execute it for themselves, you can send over a tiny proof, which is called a snark, uh, which proves merely the existence of such a transaction history without sending the history itself. So you, you send over a little proof that says, yeah, I know a transaction history, so that if you, ha you had seen it and you had executed it yourself, you would have uh, been convinced that the state was such and such. Yes? It just checks the existence, but not the consistency with the current transactions. Uh, so w w really what you prove is there is a sequence of transactions, yeah. or uh, you know, a blockchain, such that if you were to check the signatures and all those, they would be correct. And if you were to aggregate all of them, uh, the balances would be such and such. Oh, OK. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So um, cool. Oh. Right, so, oh yeah, so the project's called Coda, it's codaprotocol.com, which uh, implements this idea. Um, so, okay, uh, oh yeah, right, well, okay, so the upshot is, you know, uh, this, is, this is, pick your favorite cryptocurrency, um, grows forever, this is, this is Coda, so it's a few kilobytes. Um, so, okay, right, so I didn't say anything about lambdas yet, uh, I only said things about cryptocurrency or something, so there will be functional programming, but first, um, some background will be necessary. And before that even, I will say a little bit of like uh, further, motiv further, motiv further motivation, which is this general concept of verifiable computation. I think it's an important enough concept for me to kind of point it out to you guys and you can take it home with you. So uh, there's this idea that, you know, we're ourselves limited, right? I mean, we don't have infinite, we don't have all the computational power in the world. There are other people who have more computational power than us. And sometimes we'd like them to do the work of a computation, but uh, not have to trust them when they give us the result. So we want them to be able to compute the result, but then hand it to us and also convince us that in, in fact this was the result um, without having to uh, rerun the computation ourselves. And so there's a lot of cool applications. One you can think of is private and auditable elections. This is very far in the future, but you can also think about cloud providers who, uh, you know, com do a computation for you and prove that they did ran it correctly. So you don't have to trust that Amazon is just like sending you, you know, whatever. Um, probably you trust Amazon, but uh, and then also, th as I mentioned, this blockchain compression, which you can see is a kind of delegated computation. You know, the network somehow is doing this computation of verifying the blockchain, so no one else has to redo it. Um, so. Uh, okay, so let's talk about SNARKs. We have to. So a SNARK is, this is a, an acronym. A SNARK, SNARK is an acronym. I guess it's, a, a, as we discussed earlier, a joke um, acronym. Um, but it's a serious idea, which is a succinct. That means short and easy to check. Not interactive. That means we don't have a conversation. I just send you a piece of data. Um, argument of knowledge. So, uh, an argument of knowledge is, is like a cryptography word for proof. Okay, so uh, you know a, a little bit in more detail. They're short and easy to check proofs for statements which have the following form: I know some data such that some property holds over that data. Okay, so like I know some blockchain such that you know all the transactions in it are valid, and if you were to aggregate it, the result would be such and such. But without specifying what the data is. So are they zero knowledge by definition? So they're not zero knowledge, but yeah, I didn't say ZK. So a lot of the time people say ZK snark. ZK is zero knowledge. And, and a snark doesn't have to be zero knowledge, but it's, it's basically free to make, like all the known. It may or may not be. It may or may not be. There are some snark constructions that are not, I guess, but yeah. basically. It just seems inherent in that definition. It's not inherent. Okay. Because uh, though it is succinct, uh, you know, so you can't leak you don't have enough space even to leak that many bits of information, right? Yeah. Uh, because it's so short. But you may leak some bits. Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't necessarily have to be zero knowledge. Got it. Um, right. Oh, and, and concretely, so these things are, are really pretty tiny. They're, they're less than a kilobyte. So they're like a few hundred bytes, regardless of however big the data is. Um, and, they, and checking them takes like 10 milliseconds, regardless of how complicated this property is. OK? So kind of, I mean, really very cool, kind of shocking. So that's the universal upper bound? They're, they're always less than a k? Well, yeah. So I mean, it sort of depends on, um, yeah, essentially. It depends on how, uh, you know, your security parameter or whatever. Like, okay, okay, got it. Yeah. Um, but it, it's constant in the security parameter. So like, got it. Yep. whatever. Yep. Um, oh, uh. <laughs> Wait, I would huh? rather be no math. Right. 
<laughs> so, um, uh, okay, well, I have to kind of say it. So, well, okay, so um, there's something called a rank one, con this is like the machine model, okay? This is like the assembly. There's something called a rank one constraint system, okay? A rank one constraint is um, an equation which has this form. It's like a linear combination of variables times another linear combination of variables equals a linear combination of variables. Okay? Cool? And, uh, yeah. Okay, so that's it. Uh, what do you mean? These linear combinations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's, there are finite linear combinations. The coefficients are in this finite field, whatever. You don't really need to think too much about the coefficients, but the field has to be finite. it is a finite field, yeah, in the snark construction. So, um, okay, and then, uh, you know, associated to this idea, there's like this notion of like a satisfying assignment, right, which is just numbers to pick for all the field elements, for all the variables, so that when you plug it into the constraint system, it evaluates the true. Okay, so uh, we, we know... We know practical snark constructions, you know, sometimes you call them a proof system for proving I know some numbers so that all of the equations in some rank one constraint system are true when the numbers are plugged in. Okay? So th this is kind of like a, a universal problem. So any non-deterministic in parens computation can be coded as, as a rank one constraint system. So you have any property in mind you know, this is like an a universal kind of assembly language. You can sort of, com in principle, you can compile it down into a list of equations so that, you know, that property is satisfied if and only if those equations have a satisfying assignment. Okay? Yeah. Is there a method to do this uh, that's known? Right. Or do you have to kind of like be creative in your encoding? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, so, so that's kind of the, the whole, that's what the talk will kind of be about. Like, there, in some sense, there is a method. Here's a method. Um, well, okay, so you can simulate like and, uh, and you can simulate like negation with like multiplication and addition. And then you say, oh, well, you know, anything can compi be compiled into like a bunch of NANDs. So that's a method, but that's really crappy, right? Because they're going to be, they're going to be enormous. It's like never going to, it's never going to work. These snark constructions are like practical, but they're still slow. So it's going to be, like, you'll be dead before. Well, it's a little, yeah, I mean, it's something with field, so it's like not exactly, but. What's up? I was wondering, does that have anything to do with SMT solvers? Would that be useful much or not? Um, it, it, it might, it, SMT solvers, I could imagine SMT solvers being useful in verifying yep. implementations. Okay. So, like, you might code up a constraint system and, like, you hope that this enforces some property. It might be useful to use an SM, SMT solver to. But, like, I've looked into it, and apparently SMT solvers, like, die on. <laughs> On like non, non on like non li on like nonlinear things. Okay. Oh yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, maybe like everything interesting is kind of nonlinear. So, <laughs> um, I, I don't know. That's just what someone told me. It's true. <laughs> no, it's true. Okay. Yeah. It's true. So okay. Well, okay. Right. So I said anything can be coded. Right. So okay. So I come along and I'm, I sit down for <laughs> a few weeks and maybe I write down this giant constraint system and I promise you, oh, this is you know that program that you cared about, like. This is it, like coded up as a constraint system. Well, you're not going to believe me, right? Well, maybe that's because you didn't look close enough. So you know you can look a little closer, and and now maybe you believe me. Um, but probably you still don't believe me. So th I think you have a typo there in the. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah, that's should, right. Nine, yeah. Should be four, 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 three, four. Okay. So, um, yeah. So right. So, uh, you know, so, something's kind of screwed up here, which is. Uh, if you're a cryptographer, I guess you guys are not cryptographers, but if you're a cryptographer, you think, okay, proof system, that's it, that's enough. I have a proof system, I'm, I'm good. But really, when you think about what is a proof, it's something that's convincing to you. And for, you know, to you, you're a person, right? So you're not going to look at a constraint system and, and sort of be convinced by that. It needs to somehow connect to some concepts that you actually have in your brain. Um, so proofs do not really end at proof system. They, uh, oh, okay, some security assumption, blah, blah, blah. They, 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 only, they only end at, at proof system. So there's a whole kind of chain before you get to the proof system, right? So you start with some high-level spec or idea for the program that you have in mind. The programmer 
they translate that into some kind of encoding. So that it could be like a program in the snarky language that I'll tell you about, or like libsnark, which is this other snark library. Um, there's some kind of compiler which takes that encoding and produces a constraint system. And then only then does the proof system turn that constraint system into a, like a little snark for you. OK, does it make sense? It's, it's very similar to, it's really the same thing, actually. It's just the same thing. As you know, computation only like ends at the computer. You know, before that, you have your high-level spec. The programmer turns that into an encoding, like in OCaml or Haskell or, or Scala. Um, you run that through a compiler. You get some machine code. You run that on the hardware. That's like the proof system, and 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 you know, only then do you get your result, right? And only then are you convinced that the result is what 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 you wanted it to be. Um, Right, and at, right, so that's why I put in informal and informal. <laughs> so, um, right, so I only write in comps, you know, C, comp cert C, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Right, okay, so, you know, specifying computations is directly as constraint systems, hopefully it's clear right now. It's super error prone, and, and actually, actually, it's interesting. There, there was a huge vulnerability in this, in a bunch of cryptocurrencies where there was like a stupid overflow, like so stupid. But um, right, ironically, it's it's hard to verify correctness of of these kind of constraint systems, and um, it's it's not fun. Um, if if you try it, I, some people like programming in assembly. I like it from time to time, but um, and and making abstractions and reusing code is extremely difficult because like constraint systems aren't composable. Really, you can just you can put them next to each other, <laughs> right? That's that's what you can do with them. So. Um, you know, it's, it's all the same problems as writing assembly by hand. What, what can you do with assembly? Well, you can put them next to each other, and you can, you can simulate functions, right, by, with a particular, like, calling convention and stuff. But, um, okay, so our goal should be, just as in regular programming, a high-level language which compiles to our machine model, like rank one constraint systems. So, right, so next, x86, you know, or we have great hardware for x86. Writing x86 is tedious and error-prone. We want to make high-level languages that compile to x86. Similarly, we have these great snark constructions that they work for R1CSs. Writing R1CSs is tedious and error-prone. <coughs> we should make high-level languages that compile into R1CSs. Okay. So uh, some desiderata, really the same as always, uh, should be easy to check. This is particularly important because you, in the applications where you're usually deploying snarks, like not having correctness, the whole system is worthless, right? Um, your proofs really need to be proofs. So now we can test them with brains and tests and, and later with um, formal verification tools. Um, they should be efficient, okay. This language should be efficient, okay, same as usual deal. And also it should be fun to use. So fun, you know, um, like function, um, but also fun. No. <laughs> huh? We know what stands for. Oh, okay. <laughs> we know what fun is short for. Right, okay. So, uh, Great. So uh, here, uh, oh, right. And, and, and this is actually important because you, you really, it's really, you know, like we have types. They're like a pretty useful mechanism for helping enforce partial correctness. Good to use them. Uh, and, you know, functional programs are compositional. So you can, you can reuse, reuse them. And, and also importantly, down the line, when <laughs> we get to this stage, um, you can reuse correctness proofs as well. Um, Okay, so here's a proposal. It's a language called Snarky. It's a very simple functional language. It's basically Hindley Milner with products. Forget this. Uh, and then some kind of algebraic effect system. So like a kind of request and handler system. I'll get into what I mean. And then also like you can make assertions. Okay, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see more what I mean. Um, it's implemented as an embedded DSL in OCaml. Woo. <laughs> go, <laughs> go OCaml. This guy loves OCaml. Okay. Um, I also love OCaml, um, but for this talk, I'm not going to say anything about OCaml oh. because uh, you know the, the embedded syntax is, it's kind of ugly, right? PPX is a little ugly. Um, you'd rather well, let's do an idealized syntax. This is the, in the world where I had all the time in the world to write my own parser, and um, but you know we can pretend. So uh, I will use fake syntax. Okay, so. Let me just like kind of say like three things that are like good to take away. Like, there's this whole parallel universe of computing, at least in the short term. Before we get snark constructions that are efficient enough to just compile assembly too naively, you have to be kind of clever. Um, so there's kind of a whole parallel universe of computation with like the whole same compiler, you know, problem as usual. 
Um, functional programming techniques are useful in designing efficient expressive languages here too. And, and you know, there's not a lot of, there's like five people who like know anything about this stuff. So, and like are working on it. So like you can be one of them. Like you can be like 16% of the people who, <laughs> who think about this if you want. Um, so that's cool. Um, okay, so, uh, right, let me say something about non-determinism because that's kind of the basic computational model of snarky is this kind of non-determinism. Um, you know, let's say a non-deterministic program is a program that makes choices and, and can make assertions about values. So um, think a program that can make calls to some function, so there's some magic function called choose, which takes a type and just somehow gives you a value of that type. Um, and then there's a function called assert, which just, uh, you know, takes a constraint and asserts that it's true, and the idea is execution terminates if the constraint is not true. So, uh, okay, actually, I, I call these things requests rather than choices, because I think about it as the program, like, stopping and then, like, sticking its hand out and asking the world to, like, put something in its hand. Um, and, and, and then also, um, y you don't just put a type, you, you put sort of a tag, with, which is a ta with, with a type attached to it. Okay, so, like, there's a type called, like, request of A, like request A, which is like an, a, re a request for an A. Okay. From where, like the outside world? Or? Yeah. So when you say request, you're like asking like someone, please put in my hand an A. <laughs> you, you know. It could be a magician. It could be you know a demon. Okay. An oracle. An, yeah. It could be like um, a sat solver. I don't know. So. Um, so the, the main idea of like, okay, how do we, like, it would be nice, we'll see kind of what functional programming language I have in mind, but it, um, the, core, the core idea like driving the language is snarks let you prove I know data such that property holds on that data. It's the same thing as saying I know responses to give to a non-deterministic program P such that P on data executes without an assertion failure. Okay, those, you can, like those are the same th thing. Does that make sense? Um, but, uh, you know, remember at, at the end of the day, all we have is I know numbers so that all of the list of, you know, all of some list of equations are true when numbers are plugged in. So somehow we'll have to translate this in, into, into that world of lists of equations. Um, okay. Okay. So, right. So I said base language is just Henley Milner with tuples. So, you know, you got your functions with OCaml syntax, you got your let bindings, um, and you got, you got your tuples. Okay, cool. So, uh, oh, right, so request, so ha this is like the, the addition to the language, the interesting thing. Um, it's, so raise your hand if you, if you heard about algebraic effects. Okay, so algebraic effects, it's kind of like throwing an exception. But, you know, an exception, you're saying, ah, like I'm done, right? Like someone else, please take over for me. Throwing a request, you say, I'm done for now, but please someone up there provide me with a value and I can resume my computation with that value. Um, so, uh, yeah, right, so you, pause, you sort of pause execution, you say someone please help me out here, put something in my hand and I'm gonna keep chugging along on that. Um, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. So, um, well, okay, so uh, here is some concrete syntax. Um, this is how you declare a request in my dream world. Um, <laughs> it, it's not that much. It's not that much worse than OCaml because OCaml has these extensible variants. But um, this is in my dream world. So, for example, you'd say request solve Sudoku. So this is like imp introducing a new constructor, um, and you say, okay, solve Sudoku is a request which is parameterized by a Sudoku board, so like a Sudoku problem, and somehow returns. I expect to return a Sudoku solution. Okay, forget the SHA-256 thing. Um, and then you imagine that you also have a function request, which sort of performs a request. So it takes a request for an A as an argument and it magically produces an A, okay? Um, okay, so right, so when you have requests, you, you also need to have handlers. It's, it's a lot like exception handlers. Um, well, okay, so, so you know how, how that would look concretely is, let's say you have some computation that maybe ends up calling the solve Sudoku request, right? You can define a handler which solves a Sudoku by doing exhaustive search. Okay, so 
this says, oh, if computation makes a request for solve Sudoku with this puzzle, then respond by somehow doing an exhaustive search for a solution on that puzzle. Okay, does it make sense? This like handler's model. And you can nest handlers, it's like exception handlers. Okay? Um, Right, and then there's assertions, like I'll just kind of say quickly, it's like assertions in any language. There's some language of like what kind of constraints you're allowed to assert. Like I'll give you a hint. They're exactly rank one constraints. Um, so you can basically assert like th is this number is equal to this number um, at the base. And you should think that like execution aborts when you assert false. Okay, so you know, what you actually prove is, is the following. So normally, you know, we make an R1CS, we make an R rank one constraint system. Uh, and we prove, well, I know numbers I can plug in to make everything set value to true. It's snarky, write a program, and what gets proved is, I know values of the appropriate types to answer all the requests made by P with, so that P can execute without an assertion failure. Does that make sense? I know how to stuff in, I know how to make this program chug along to the end. Okay? Um, so, like, let me do a contrived example. So you can see it in action. Um, it will be the following. Let's make a snark which proves I know a Sudoku solution to some given board, which has as one of its rows 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay? Is it cool? So, let's see what time is it. Ah, we'll have so much time. This is such a short talk. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to write, that's the same thing as saying we're going to write a snarky program so that this holds if and only if. Uh, that program, we can provide answers to that program's requests so that it executes without an assertion failure. Okay? So we're going to try and make a program so that, you know, we can answer all its requests if and only if we know a Sudoku solution which has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It's one of its rows. Yeah? Uh, random question. Was this inspired by logic programming at all? It was kind of just like, oh, like, like, here's like, here's like how you make this up. Yeah. It's like, okay. Snarks let you certify execution of non-deterministic programs, sure. essentially. How do we model non-determinism in functional programming? Like, there is a relationship. What, what, one way we model it is with algebraic effects. Yeah. So that's it. Okay. Fair enough. But because I could just show that this exists, this is proved when only this solution to this arbitrary problem exists. It kind of just reminds me of kind of like a logic language. It's like the way like backtracking works. Out, but yeah. I could be just yeah. tangent. Yeah, I, don't, I guess that's one. Yeah, I'm not sure. You don't actually have to find the. Yeah, it's a different structure. You have to find it this time. But right, some magic person does it for you. Yeah. Maybe a logic language. But like the magic yeah, person right. is secretly. Yeah, yeah it could be a logic programming language. It could be an SMT solver. Yeah, it could be you. Yeah, right. Could, yeah. Be, could be a lookup table. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so let's go through a solution. I, I didn't, or an example, I didn't, uh, you know, I put some dot dot dots in there, but okay. So right, remember we have this uh, uh, request that we invented, solve Sudoku, which given a board is supposed to somehow produce for us a solution. Um, let's say we manage to code up uh, assert is a solution, which takes a board and a proposed solution and somehow checks that it's a solution. Then we can sort of hide that away by defining a, a non-deterministic function called solve, which takes a Sudoku board as input and magically produces a solution. And the way it works is it says, okay, get a solution from my environment, by magic. Assert that that's a solution. Oh, I forgot to put the board here. Assert that that's a solution to the board, and then return the solution. Okay? So you know if you ever actually get here, then actually that is a solution. Does that make sense? And so this is really kind of nice now because now, now it's composable. So let's imagine we code up, you know, has row in order. So that, by that I meant like has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 9 is a row. And we can just say, like, as our main, you know, has row and order of find solution of my board. Okay? So, th so and, you know, the way that we say ha has row and order is we say, oh, there exists some row, uh, which is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9. And, okay. So, so it, it's cool because uh, now things are very composable. I say, okay, first I can have this concept of just finding solution. And uh, then once I have it, I just pass it, you know, as an argument to this function, which just checks if it has a row in order. Um, so, uh, you know, you might wonder, like, okay, w where are all the constraints and stuff? Like, come on, show me something. So, um, I'll, I'll show you how you would kind of, this is kind of a fun thing, you know, we have so much time, so 
this is kind of a fun thing. Like, I'll teach you a little bit about snark programming, the way that you code, code things. It's really quite a lot of fun. Um, let's see how we would code this like exists function. And I, yeah, I'll show you some of this. But. Oh, okay, sorry, before that. <laughs> you know, uh, and then you could have a handled main which basically says, oh, handle whatever you know, the main was before with, oh, if you know, it asks me to solve Sudoku board and just do some exhaustive search, okay? So, uh, oh yeah, so like let's see how kind of this boils down to just request, making assertions, these arithmetic assertions at the end of the day. Um, so, uh, okay, so let's go top down, I guess. So exists x is f is, uh, you know, are any of the booleans that you get by mapping f over x is true, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so now we wonder, okay, how do you implement any? And this is where something gets interesting. So the way that you encode Booleans in this world, like at the end of the day, somehow everything is really encoded as field elements. So Booleans are basically just field elements which are constrained to be either zero or one. It's a finite field, you have zero and one, okay. Uh, then there's some way of implementing equality, okay, we can, we can see, but uh, you know, you have these field, field elements, I can make arithmetic constraints, which means essentially I can do additions and multiplications. So in particular, I can do additions. So what I do is I, I take my bools, I sum them all up, and I say it's not the case that the sum of all these bools is zero. So if any of them are true, then, it, then that will be the case, right? And if not any of them are true, then, well, then the sum will be zero. Does that make sense? And then you sort of code not as, well, not b is, is one minus b. Does that make sense? So, yeah. It's not mod two, it's mod p, where p is like actually super big in practice. Oh, fair. Then is that even a boolean then? If it's mod p, is that boolean? Well, there. I mean, you know, it's a value which is constrained to be either zero or one. Oh, and that's a bool. But like in general, it's all mod p. But like for bool, it's just zero and one, and we're just doing mod two. We don't do uh, so. Sort of natively, we only have access to addition mod p. Like, like in reality, it's a list of field elements. Yeah, so, so in reality, bool is really like field elements, and that's like hidden under, you know, as an abstract, as like an abstract type. It's just like a bool, but like under the covers, it's actually just a field element, which happens to be constrained to be either zero or one. But there's no addition on this side, so the only operation over boolean is not. So yeah. only oh, but I also, I did some. So you should imagine there's like an implicit coercion or something. To field elements. So it'll, like, it'll be some way I didn't want to write an explicit. Field and it acts like boolean dish. Okay, sure. So well, it's not going to act like boolean addition. You want to do the addition mod p. So you just have these numbers, which are just integers mod p, which are constrained to either be zero or one. And then you just add them all up, right? You, that's like counting the number of them which are true. Counting the number of them which are true. Right. Just by adding them all. That's what you can do by adding them all up. Oh, that's fair. Right. And then. Oh, I got it. Gotcha, gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then you say, right, they're all, like, they're all false if uh, when you add them all up, the number of which, them which are true is zero. Yeah, you're just getting out of that sneak way, got it. Yeah, so you have to be kind of tricky like this, but uh, yeah, so th that's another kind of nice thing about this approach, which is like, you don't, you don't really, you don't lose, you know, the argument for like writing constraint systems by hand is, uh, it's more efficient, right? But it's actually, it's actually not really. This is kind of like a zero, cost abstraction, like the, this whole idea of function like kind of disappears when you compile to a constraint system. You just sort of execute it and like get all the constraints and then like that's it. So, oh, I don't know, I never write APL. Ma ma maybe, maybe. Maybe you do hacks like that, I don't know. So, um, okay, cool. So, uh, right, so like, you know, semantically the way that you think about a snarky program is you can, Interpret it to get a constraint system. Basically, you, you run it and you see like, okay, what constraints did this create? What assertions did this make? Or you can run it to get an assignment to that constraint system plus uh, the final value. Okay, plus a proof maybe. Okay, so, um, right. So as I mentioned, like in the long run, in the long run, someone will come up with the super efficient snark compiler that just takes uh, LVM and somehow compiles that to snarks, but that's like 10 years from now. So uh, in the meantime, efficiency unfortunately still matters. 
um, y y it should be easy to sort of drop down to the low level. And so you can kind of think of this language as, it's kind of like C. You know, C, what is C, right? I mean, it's like a, a it's like a, you know. <laughs> right, well, okay, I mean, <laughs> you, you know, like compare, you compare C to assembly, like, what's the difference that if you like write the name of a function then put open curly brace and end curly brace that like does something to a stack that like just put some code <laughs> there that like does something with a stack you, you you know what i'm saying c is like a very thin layer on top of assembly it's like you compile like begin function end function to like doing something with a stack and you compile like uh uh you know for loops to like doing something with with a counter and like a go to right you see what i mean but like it's a very thin layer, and and also this is a very thin layer. Um, so, uh, okay, so uh, I'll give you an example of somehow something that we can do super efficiently. This is kind of cool. This is maybe not very important, but uh, I'm being so decadent about time. Why not? Um, so uh, this is like a great snark programming hack. Um, you have some variables x, y, and b, and you want to make a constraint system, okay, which in, which enforces uh, b is boolean, and b is zero if x is not equal to y, and b is one if x happens to be equal to y, okay. So the the way that you do that is is really great. I don't know who made this up, but um, it's it's um, this is it's kind of like it's not exactly like this, but there's something called the um, some Russian whatever. It, it, I won't even say try and say who made it up, but okay. Well, maybe I won't write on the board. So, so here's how you do it. So first of all, you introduce a new variable, inv, which you constrain to be sort of like the inverse of x minus y, kind of. So, uh, well, you'd have to kind of think through through this, I guess. It's probably not worth it. <laughs> Trust that if you, you can, you guys should try and think about it. Like, if b is zero here, well, okay. So let's see. So if b is zero. Then, then this is one, which means that x cannot be equal to y. Because if x was equal to y, you'd have zero times something is one, right? That can't happen. So if b is zero, then you get x is equal to x is equal to y. Now let's see, can b be one, or what's what happens when b be one, b is one? Well, if b is one, you know this is one. You have x minus y is zero, so x is equal to y. And furthermore, b is constrained by these equations to be boolean. You can think th through that. Inv is just like I, I ask for another variable. I'm just like, we'll see. Maybe in the example, it will make more sense. Sure. It's just another. I introduce another variable okay. into my constraint system. Yeah. So it's free. So it can be assigned in order to satisfy. Um, the yeah. It's sort of an auxiliary variable. Anyway. So. Um, yeah. Okay. So the, you can you can really. As I said, it's really a thin layer. You can encode that kind of thing, really direct kind of constraint hacking, um, really easily. You just say, okay, let's say I have a request uh, for a field element and I have a request called bool for a bool, okay? So I want to write my equals function which takes x and y, which are field elements, and returns a bool. Okay, first I say request uh, some field element to be inv. That was like that in from the other side. Request some uh, boolean called result. Um, assert that constraint that we saw on the other side, slide, and assert that other constraint that we saw on the other side, and return result. Okay? So what, what's nice about this is that it's, it's totally composable, and um, the external signature totally hides the fact that it's doing something, you know, that it has some auxiliary variable in the middle, or whatever. All you see on the outside is, oh, there's a function, which takes two field elements and produces a Boolean. So you don't have to, you don't expose kind of the internals of, oh yeah, it has like this auxiliary variable and, and whatever. Um, returns a boolean or fails. Right? No, no, uh, it asserts. Returns a, well, for some notion of returns a boolean, yeah. returns a boolean. Right. Depends what you mean by returns a boolean. You know, I didn't really specify semantics ever, so mm. gotcha. No, so, um, okay, so uh, that's cool. So whatever, this doesn't really matter. Um, just to kind of sum up the benefits of this approach, probably you already kind of believe me in like, because you don't have any, you, you guys probably never programmed Snark, so you, you have to believe me, no. Um, so uh, 
the, the benefits are, sorry? The power of snark compels them. Right. So uh, some, some benefits of this approach, okay, it's compositional, right? Functions are compositional, you can compose them. There's this kind of no cost ability to abstract. So you can drop down to the low, low level like you, know, like you can with C if you want. Um, the, the functions like totally disappear when you compile to a constraint system. Um, types help with safety. Uh, and um, the fact that it's written in a high-level language makes it a lot easier to verify than that mess of constraints that I showed you before. It's still before. a little bit hard. To verify. Yeah. Brandon reviews my PRs, so uh, <laughs> he can, yeah. It takes a very long time. But, but, but it's easier than reading constraints by hand. Yeah. <laughs> And well, okay, so the top level things though are relatively easy to verify, right? Yeah. The, the, the things that sort of hide all the constraint hacking in like, function like calls. The equal, you know, where, you have to do where you do constraint hacking, that's a little, you have to think through it, but, but it's kind of encapsulated. Yeah? So at the end, this, this model is kind of like you write a program and it has all of these entry points and these requests. Yeah. And the way you kind of like run the program is you kind of can order and supply a value to each of these requests, and then if you can keep going and there's never like, if it keeps asking for requests, I need another one, you supply it, and then it's like, okay, all the assertions passed, I need another one, and you keep going all the way until the program finishes without throwing like, an exception on the assertion or whatever, then that's like a successful, you've supplied the parameters to the rank one. Yeah, system, yeah, exactly. So you've solved the right, and then you can hand it off to the, to the libsnark, which is this, it implements this snark construction, and then it does the cryptography, and... Okay. and yeah. It's like blockchains, you like make a small program and start saying, hey, if you look at all the blocks previous to now, all the balances that add up basically, and then start programming. Right, yeah. something like that. I mean, you have to, so you can't really do that. Um, ideally, but like not really. Right, ideally you can't, right, it's, it's always that way, right? So ide <laughs> ideally you want to do this, in reality you can't do this. So right. th that would be the ideal thing. The thing is, snarks ni sort of natively let you certify fixed size computations. Sure. You need to sort of fix the constraint system up front. So there's natively, it's not clear, you know, a blockchain, you don't know how big that's going to get, right? So it's not clear, okay, how can you handle a computation which may be arbitrarily long? And then there's a trick called recursive composition, which uh, lets you do that. And I encourage everyone to Google recursive composition because it's kind of cool. Um, and like afterward, I can explain it if people are interested, but I don't want to force people to listen. So... Um, Oh yeah, so you know, composition. Well, okay, these are these are probably more relevant to people who like think about think about snarks more. Um, so, uh, well, maybe for the sake of the video, I'll go through them. Sorry, guys. So, uh, right. So one of this benefit, one of these benefits is, is compositionality. Um, you just have these functions. You don't sort of explicitly declare your auxiliary inputs or your so-called witnesses. You know, you don't declare like here here are the variables that like I want someone to provide a satisfying assignment for. They're sort of Implicitly, uh, implicitly discovered as you execute the program and the program makes requests. Um, the semantics will eventually make compositional correctness proofs possible. So, you know, at the end of the day, you, need to, you, you, wanna, you, have, some, you have some notion of like, how to execute a snarky program to get a constraint system. And what you want to somehow prove is that like, uh, if you, you, know, you write some spec in like, a normal programming language, like OCaml, and you want to prove that uh, this snarky program somehow faithfully implements this spec. Um, and uh, if, you, if you have functions, you, you can sort of do the correctness proofs function by function and then glue them together. But if you just have constraint systems, uh, it, there's, no, there's no clear way to kind of break up the correctness proofs. And it seems kind of un insurmountable. Um, right. And, and you really, you know, for this, you kind of need compositional semantics for your programming language. Um, there's a, there's a, something called libsnark, which is another way of, of coding up snarks. Um, but the semantics <laughs> are basically like run the C++ code, see what happens. Um, so if you want to write correctness proofs, you need something more restricted. Um, there's a no cost abstraction, so you can do these constraint hacks underneath the covers and kind of expose a clean functional interface. Um, so you don't really lose out on efficiency. You know, any program that you could write in libsnark or you know, sort of directly by hand with constraints, you can write it just as efficiently here, and like kind of abstract it away to have a clean functional interface. Um, you can also use types, which is great because OCaml has a great type system, and so you, you sort of inherit the whole OCaml type system um, if it's an embedded DSL. Um, 
for example, I mentioned like this Boolean thing, which is like, you know, just happens to be a field element, but which is constrained to be Boolean, but you, ha you have an abstract type which hides that, um, and so no one can know. Whereas like in, in LibsDark, uh, Booleans are just normal field elements which ho hopefully have been constrained to be 0, 1, but not necessarily. Um, right, and also, you know, it's high level, higher level code is just easier to check. Um, there's another cool thing about this request and handler system, which is you can sort of partially test the, the sufficiency of your constraints. Like, oh, are these constraints really good enough to sort of constrain the final value as much as I want it to be constrained? By stuffing in fake values into the requests, stuffing in values other than the intended ones. So like in that equals code, you know, it makes a request for field element, it makes a request for bool. There's some intended meaning, right? That bool should be the bool which indicates whether or not they're equal, and that other inf thing should be some function of the two variables. But there's no reason you have to do that, right? I mean, you could, the snark isn't stopping you from stuffing in whatever you want and seeing if you can make all the constraints pass. Um, so uh, having handlers is, is useful for sort of stuffing in fake values to try and um, see if, if your code is good enough. Um, right, as I said, eventually we can write correctness proofs. Okay, so takeaways again, I'm just gonna re like re repeat myself. Snarks are this new parallel universe of computing, maybe for the next five, 10 years, probably 10 years. Um, you can, instead of executing a program to get a value, you, ex you execute a program to get a value along with the proof that the val value was computed by that program, okay? Um, functional programming techniques are useful for efficiency and, and uh, expressivity and safety. Um, and as I said, you know, there's only a few of us, so <laughs> you can be one person. I, and, and, it's, and it's really cool. Um, but I'm so much more than one person. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah. I know, Brandon, you have anything to add? Uh, you, you should show the embedded DSL. Oh, I can show the real code if people, if people want. Sure. Oh, okay. and also, oh yeah, what's up? Um, so, nothing yet about zero knowledge, actually. I didn't say anything about zero knowledge. The zero knowledge thing is that all those requests are, are hidden. So, like, no one can tell anything about the values that you stuffed in for those requests. That's what makes it zero knowledge. But, yeah. So, uh, right. Oh, yeah, it's on GitHub. That's, I just want to say that real quick. Yeah. So, is, so I would write the program um, for somebody to provide me the, the correct answer for, or like to do the computation, right? And then I would send them the program, and then the zero knowledge, uh, in the zero knowledge way, they would supply the inputs, and then as an output, they would get this proof, and they would be able to send me the proof, and then I could verify that the proof, that they had the inputs that they provided to the program that I wrote actually made it not, like, all the assertions passed. That's right. And then, since it's not zero knowledge, because we didn't really talk about it. But it, it, it actually is zero knowledge. Sure, sure. Just for this case, yeah. we didn't really talk about parties exchanging the index. So right. Therefore, we didn't talk about zero knowledge. Yeah. But it actually, like, it, everything is zero knowledge, meaning, like, the proof that they provide you doesn't leak any information about the witnesses that they plugged in, except for what you could deduce from knowing that it was a valid proof. Right. That's what zero knowledge means. So, oh, more questions? No, people are good. Yeah, what's up? I'm curious how you implement effects. Oh, it's kind of funny, actually. So, well, we can see the concrete syntax in OCaml, I guess. It, there's like a free monad. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> Does that answer it? <laughs> I mean, that's essentially how in OCaml you implement algebraic effects is with freer. Or, yeah. yeah, we can see an example. There's like a free monad, and then there's like some uh, weird like hackery to like try and make the matching syntax look nice. And also, you use the extensible variance. I'll, I'll show you. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I can show you. Let's see. Yeah, more. Can you show the election example? Or, or do you actually want to show like, plot the code? No, no, no I'll, I'll do that. I'll do the election thing. <coughs> Is it big enough? Oh, OK. So I think there's a request in here somewhere. Ah, so, okay. So the way that you declare requests, it's not really that bad. So there's some, um, 
OCaml has this crazy, like, extensible variants feature. Raise your hand if you know about this feature. OK. Only OCaml hackers. So um, it, it's really kind of a weird feature, but it makes sense. So like, exception, exception types are, are extensible in the sense that you can sort of add variants to them. So OCaml generalizes this to have like arbitrary, arbitrary types be extensible in, in the sense that you can always just add more variants if you want. OK? People know what I mean? It's it's more like you know like usually usually you say like oh my, like I declare a type and like it's either this or this or this, and like that's it right. In OCaml you say I declare a type and it's extensible, and la then later I can say, sure. ah there's a new constructor of this type. There's a new constructor of this type. It's this or this or this or this dot dot dot. Yeah. Could be more. So any value of that type could could be of another variant. Yeah, what's up? Wouldn't that be crazy if you just kept on extending in every single file? It's like, which, where did I extend this file the right way, or this type the right way? Like, wouldn't you like lose track of like, where you extended it at some point? Um, I don't know. I'd probably do go to definition okay. in, in Vim. I don't know. Um, I, it, it means that like you always have to, it's like with exceptions, like you, you always may have unhandled cases. You know what I mean? Oh, so you can also have like a localized extension, basically, if I want to function. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. yeah, yeah, you can, yeah, you can declare them locally and like, yeah, it's cool. Um, oh yeah, so uh, this was some kind of funny example with like uh, an election, and we have a request for, for like opening a ballot. So there was this idea of like, you close a ballot basically by like taking your vote and like hashing it, sure. and then you know because you can't go back, it's like closed, but you've committed to your vote. Um, so, uh, in, this was like some example of running an election with some security properties and like you add a request for opening a ballot, which takes the ID of the ballot, this is like the voter name, okay, and returns uh, an opened ballot, which is like the pre-image to this hash. Um, and you know, type constructors are like backwards in OCaml, so. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, we can see more. Probably people can look at this, you know, on their own time. Yeah. Uh, it's not really a question, but a comment. Yeah. There is a paper called uh, EFF directly in OCaml. Yeah. Um, it's like Oleg's paper or something. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. That, that solves some of these issues. For example, that uh, variant is open, right? So you can have the dose of checking, for example. But the reason why you want it open is to be able to extend it. So in that paper, A, he implements effects using a different approach, but B, he uses the typed effects. Ideas. Yeah. yeah it's probably, it. yeah, it's probably like, I, I did it this way because this, this is like the easiest way. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I don't know how I feel about typed effects. Who has an opinion? About typed effects? Yeah. At this conference, people will like Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. As, as opposed to what, I think. Would Untyped. Like it doesn't say what effects it oh, doesn't it so it's leaves. Like IO. Yeah. Right, it's like an untyped effect because like right. any effect. Can happen, right? like in that or no, what I mean is like um, you may have some computation that makes some requests, but the fact that it makes those requests isn't exposed in the type. But then how do you keep track of what's happening? I guess in your head. Yeah, right. I think that answers. <laughs> That's why we don't like it. I don't know. Does anybody want to argue for untyped effects? I don't have a strong argument. But I was gonna. Uh, takes a request and yeah. returns an A. Yeah. I was wondering why you wouldn't like have this parameterized request type. Get rid of the request A argument and return A and just have that be request A. It's like this is a computation that returns an a, a. an A and it does a request and it's kind of like embedded in the type. You know, it's not that it takes it takes a request and then returns an A. It's that this is this value is a request returning an A. Yeah, and maybe I mean that's that's like probably one approach to like kind of implementing like type. this kind of type exception or like type requesting. I don't know. It can never go away. Like something that does make a request. Right, and then like handle somehow eliminates something from the list or whatever. Yeah. Oh yeah, like handle could like remove that. That's yeah. So that's kind of how you implement it. But yeah, and then I don't know. So like maybe we can look at concrete syntax since you asked about for handling. <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> so you say handle this computation and then you provide the handler as a function 
um, you, you know, the continuation is kind of made explicit. Um, but, so, does that make sense? Yeah. It's kind of, it's not that bad. Um, but if you want to do, like, formal proof of this system. Oh, yeah. So, like, the next, the next step is, like, implement this in cock. Like, just, like, copy the, you know, it's OCaml, it's kind of like cock, and just, like, copy it, and then, um, and then, I don't know, you, then you need to kind of be a little bit more formal. I have a stack, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. Anyway. Questions? More questions? No, people are good. Okay. Oh, yeah. Is there any idea to move this out of OCaml? Yeah, I would love to. So, <laughs> what? I love OCaml, but I don't like <laughs> Monad syntax. I don't know. I, or, or I'd rather not think about Monads, I guess. I'd rather, I, I like the kind of F style, like there's no Monads, like these effects just happen. Um, so uh, I, I, I find that kind of easier to, to think about. So like I, I would like that to be implemented at some point. And like, this in, you know, you wouldn't have to do this ugly thing where I'm like, oh, it's a function that like takes some magic thing with, that has a, the name with. And, um, so, uh, so there are implementations of F, the FF, for OCaml and Scala and Haskell at this point. So, I mean, if, you, if so, if your concern is you've rolled your own algebraic effect system here. Oh, the concern is more just like having nice syntax. So, like, you, you could like. It's not a DSL anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is a DSL, but not an embedded DSL. So, like, you could you could like take you could like take F and then like change it. To do snark stuff, that, that would probably be the most reasonable way is like modifying the implementation of that. But yeah, I think what's really going to happen though is like we'll implement this in Cock, and then maybe we have a front end that like compiles um, to the Cock AST type. Um, that would be, I think, the nicest way. Um, oh, I would like to, but there are no immediate plans to do that. Yeah, so that's what I was saying with Cock, like. We would like have a front end that like compiles to some a AST type in in Coq, and then there would be some mechanism for proving things about parts of programs. Anyway, um, and like it would be a separate program language, um, but kind of an, actually there, there is something nice about it being an embedded DSL, which is in in these handler bot blocks you can just do anything or camel, right? Like this is the magic. This is like magic, and so like you can just do anything here, and like it's cool because you already have like a programming language to let you do anything. So you'd have to kind of figure out some good story there. Call a shell script or something. I don't know. It seems horrible to me. So, yeah. So I can't, can't quite tell from this, from this code, but is your embedding in the final tagless style? Or, you know? um, I can show you. You can look at the horrible AST type. <laughs> it's, not, eh, it's not that bad. This is like the giant. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of like that. So there, it's it's like a it's like a free monad, but like it's OCaml, so you like just inline everything. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, <laughs> it's basically just a big AST. Yeah. So the reason I ask is because with finally tagless, it would be easier to target some other language completely, like, like to actually write an interpreter that would, that would compile it to your to your alternative. You'd be able to break up the one type that was Right. I, tell me about it afterward. I, maybe I don't know about it. Um, okay, cool. I don't want to. Oh, it's already. Yeah. I was too decadent with the time. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, now we're late for lunch. Okay, great. So, uh, cool. Thank you guys. Yeah.